So here I am. I am joined by the man behind Commander Group Fitness himself, Mr. Jamie Goss. Little round of applause there. Here we are. So how are we surviving lockdown? How are you getting on, mate? Yeah, mate, it's not too bad, to be fair. I, um, as you are aware, I was a Royal Marines Commander for 20 years. And um, when you go away on deployment for whether it's four months, five months, six months a year, you're sort of in self-isolation anyway. You know, especially if you're, um, say, in Afghanistan or Iraq, where you can't speak to people or have Wi-Fi. So it's not, that's, that's the approach I've gone with. I've just treated it as another deployment. It's okay. So that, that's an interesting point in that, being able to use that experience to try and replicate as such. Because I think that's what's used in a lot of sense of what your training is to then be used in further situations. You can apply certain elements to it. So talk us through how you got into um, the Marines in the first place. Like, What was your background before that? Well, um, quite an interesting story, really. My, my grandparents, both sides, were military. Um, and uh, granddad on my mum's side, uh, it was a desert rat then um, when they uh, rolled out the parachute regiment in, was it 1942, something like that? 1943, he um, went... There, he ended up as a sergeant major in the Paras. My dad's dad, who I never met, he died before I was born, but he was a um, he was in the army. So it was sort of in in the in the family. On my mum, all my mum's side, sorry, on my mum's side, there was a couple of people in the army and RAF and Royal Navy. But I'm not, but my dad was not. My dad, um, you know, he, dad was a bit so say rough around the edges. And um, but I was getting so much bother as a young kid, mixing in the wrong groups, stealing from shops, getting in fights, doing doing stupid stuff, you know, uh, nicking mo mopeds and things. And um, I think I was up in I'd been to court, um, I think twice by the time I was fifteen. Um, so what, what my dad did, he he said, "Do I know who the Marines are?" I had no idea who the Marines were. I thought I thought the Marines were American and they went on boats. That was my, my limit of the Marines was watching Clint Eastwood films, you know. Uh, I mean, that's, that's God's honest. And uh, so, no, next thing you know, my dad signed, my dad signed me up to the Marines. Um, and I, I massively respected my dad, you see. And for all his faults, which he had many, but we all do, he was the only person ever respected. Um, but, but also... I didn't want to cross my dad at the same time. So there was a bit of a bit of fear and a bit of respect thrown in together there. So he signed me up and that was it. When I was 18, off I went. So talk us through the initial like emotions of that. So obviously, how did you feel on that sort of, you signed up for it, you're 18, you're about to show up. Is it yeah. a, fe- a feeling of you want to be there? Do you feel like you're dragged? Do you feel excited? What's your initial feeling? Yeah. <laughs> I remember leaving the um, Johnson. I'm, I'm colorblind, not massively, but I'm colorblind, and uh, you're not allowed to join the military if you've got colorblindness. And um, I went through, went to the careers office, and this is careers office in Bletchley, and uh, it was run. This was 1990, 91 time, uh, and it was being run by the Navy. And I had this warrant officer in the Navy who was my point of contact. And uh, he he was awesome, mate. He was my first contact with the military outside my mother's dad, my granddad, and mum's side. And he was a nice guy, very, and he was very helpful. And um, I, how he was selling the Marines to me was like it was the best thing in the world, you know. All your dreams will come true, and all this. I thought, brilliant, great. Anyway, I went through the testing, which was a week long down at the commando training centre, which was horrific. You know, you're talking for a guy who uh, used to go to the gym, a little bit of running, played a bit of rugby, then went down to for a week's worth of getting thrashed down at the commando training centre. I had no idea what was going on. Luckily, I came for, I came top of the group and because of my, and it's a good job I did, because of all my results, my mental results, my test results, my physical results, they were in the top tier, but obviously because I had colour blindness, they automatic, it's an automatic fail. But this warrant officer that I spoke about previously, he came around my house on a Saturday morning with a load of different coloured wires. Um, and he was just saying, what colour is this? What colour is that? And it was like blue and green, red and yellow. 
So I went, I got to like a back door entrance into it, really. I passed everything else, because like, I was colorblind. He come round with his own back, did this test, and there you go, I was in. I mean, that never happened now. It never happened now. Anyway, it turned up January the 6th, 1992, um, at Limpton Commando, which is the train station there. And uh, I was really excited. Loved it, because this the week-long PRC that I had, the potential recruits course, and this warrant officer, Made it out to be amazing. I love, I love, I love training hard. Got there, fuck me, what a rude awakening. Uh, my, I, I had no idea what day of the week it was for the first six weeks. It was horrific, uh, mate, horrific. My, me thinking that the Marines were, you know, what my my perception was was not what they were. They were, I knew they were, well, from what I'd read, uh, an elite bunch of guys, hard as nails. My God, I so underestimated it. Honestly, like it, I was. But the thing is, I was more. If I, if my dad was at my dad, so I was more scared of my dad than anybody else, the Marines, whoever. I think I would have left. I would have just gone. No, this is not for me. But because I was more scared of failing for my dad because of what may happen, I stuck at it, and thankfully I did. But mate, honestly, God, my my uh, perception of all Marines training was about a fifth of what it was it was just horrendous but, well, um, but yeah. well there's a few things to sort of go from there so before you said you joined you're quite a bit of a tear away a bit of like i don't know if it was like a rebel without a cause kind of thing or just a bit you know like a young kid just being whatever else but then to go from that to almost the polar opposite of being regimented being organized and disciplined how did you initially feel going into that kind of environment well well the thing is, Dan, uh, uh, I'm sure some people will disagree with this. I've never been an arsehole. Never have been. Um, I've always been the character that I am. You know, um, I've always done what I thought was the right thing to do. Now, when I was a kid, I was influenced by younger people, you know, because I was the youngest in the group, like little gang. I would be the one who had to go into the shop and steal some cigarettes or I had to go and do something. And that's how good call and then I was told, you know, I've got to steal that motorbike, Jamie, you know. So that was being influenced by the wrong people. But I was never a um I was never a dick, you know, I was never a um oh fuck you mate, I'm gonna do this. I was never like that. Um so going from what I was, once I was taken away out of that environment and what people expected me to be when I was young, people expected me to be this, you know, Oh, Jamie will do it. Jamie didn't. That's sort of, I got pigeonholed a little bit, I think. Um, but no, joining the Marines, mate, honest to God, complete breath of fresh air. And I went in there with an open mind, um, and no attitude. And it's a good job I didn't have an attitude because I wouldn't have lasted. Um, but yeah, so in all fairness to you, mate, it was fine. You know, there, there was no, there was no a hang up from, from myself or anything. So. Well, th- that's an interesting point you just touched on there is just to, sort of skip around timelines a little bit so from that point you're then not so much the runt of a group for lack of a better choice you're the one doing all the sort of the bitch work as such doing the you know you've got to do the actual things to now where you are being the leader of a group you've started your yeah. list you've then tra- transitioned and i'm sure we'll get into it a bit further on as to what parts of that has really brought that out of you but it's really interesting hearing that kind of before and after like obviously without the the interval mentioned but it's, it's interesting yeah. that transition in itself to sort of go from being you know, the one who's thought of as the one who will do whatever you tell him to do, to being the one who leads instead mm. of, and also it'd be interesting to see how your leadership style has changed through that sort of time as well. So yeah. to go through um the next sort of stage, on the same point initially I made about changing that environment. So now you've clarified a bit more that it's not so much a, a need to rebel against anything. It's more just do what you're told, get on with it kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. a, a kind of experience, it sort of seems like you'll fit more in that kind of environment then after hearing that. So regards to the mental discipline, the mental toughness it takes, because obviously the idea of this is to try and like break you down. And uh, yeah. also before we just carry on with stuff, if there's any like phrases or terms and stuff you take as red, feel free to, you know, go a bit more layman's with stuff, a bit more breaking down because I'm going to, I would say it's for other people, but it might be for me as well <laughs> to try and understand a bit more like detail on certain things. So say like when you're being broken down in these sessions, what is in your head keeping you motivated, pushing you through these 
like you know torturous workouts and whatever else well to be honest with you uh i right this all goes back to when with my dad right uh, as i said to you um i was more scared of my dad than anybody else you know like my mum and dad split up a couple of times when i was a young kid um and my dad my dad was always fighting he was you know i'm not I'm not painting him out to be a great guy or I'm not painting him out to be the worst guy. He, he was my dad and I loved him and feared him and respected him, right? And so police were called countless times with a bit of domestic stuff going on and mum left and my sister worked with mum, but I stayed with my dad. Um, but my dad didn't want me to, he told me to, um, his words were fuck off for your mum. But my loyalty, my sort of... Um, uh, my belonging as such was always with dad. Um, and because dad was such a hard man, and uh, uh, if I did something, if I stepped out of line, I knew about it, you know. Um, and like if ever the parents got called into school for me misbehaving, then I knew as soon as I went home, I'd be getting the belt, you know, I'd just be getting bent over his knee and it with a belt. So, um, and because of that, because of my conditioning from there, from being disciplined, paying attention to what I've been told. Now, this is a big thing there, Dan. Paying attention to what you've been told. So you, in your world, right, you know from when you started MMA, you were told one thing, you did the opposite because you weren't sure how it went, so you thought you were doing the right thing and you weren't. And in real time, that's going to that's gonna mess you up, right? And it's the same with, with the Marines. If I'd have gone in the Marines, being the big I am, knowing everything, you know, not paying any attention to anybody, I would have failed and found it so hard. But because of my mental conditioning from my upbringing, I actually, after the initial shock of capture, the initial six weeks, I really enjoyed it. I really got into it and excelled at it and was rose to the top of every challenge. Um, so, yeah, it, it was it was different. It was different for me to experience because I had no idea. Mate. Here you go. First day I turned up, they said to us, don't worry about making your beds. You have a maid that comes in at six o'clock to clean up and tidy up and do your beds. I believed him. That's how much of a mug it was. I believed him. <laughs> See, you said that too. Yeah. yeah. There's me uh, please sleeping away, you know, having a great dream about whatever. Next thing you know, the drill instructor's coming, kicking us all out of bed at five o'clock in the morning, shouting, screaming, throwing kit everywhere. Mate, what a rude awakening, honestly. <laughs> but, but yeah, honestly, I had no idea what day of the week was, let alone what I was doing. But, uh, yeah, that was it. Then I'm, you know, Things happen for a reason, Dan. I'm a firm, I'm a hundred percent believer in that. Um, you, my, I love my dad dearly. He's dead now, sadly, and I, I miss him every day. Um, but would I raise my child that way? Not on a, no way. Not for a, or, or as much money as you'd give me. No way. But different times. And what my dad did would he installed discipline, courage, loyalty, integrity all the key things that you need as a good person. Um, but also what he installed was don't take a backward step from people, i.e. where I get in bother because I'm not going to take shit from somebody. I'll give them I'll give them free warnings. If they haven't sorted their act up by free warnings, they get what they get. And that's been installed from me from an early age. You know, it's, it, it's the character of who you are. My dad built me in the Marines, Marines, honed my skills that's the best way i can say it like there's so many things to dissect in all this thing it's just so interesting one thing you pointed out early on in that was um being coachable almost that's the sort of way i've got from that is it's very tempting when you think you know something to feel like you know everything and i've fallen yeah. into that many a time of thinking oh i understand what they're explaining to me but then they actually carry on explaining it and think oh i guess i don't and so on and so forth i guess if you were open to that mindset of okay if I don't open my mouth, I actually listen to what they're saying and can take these things on. It can really help you flow. It's almost like swimming against the current almost if you're not trying to listen to what they're saying and do what they're telling you oh, to do. That's a good analogy, that, Dan. Very good. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's very good. Yeah. So, so you're, you're, you're understanding what's going on there. You're understanding to grow with them and then mm. you can then build with that. And another thing you touched on just near the end of that point about how you raise your kids differently to the way your dad did. That is a really interesting concept because with this sort of change of the times and about, you know, hitting your kids and all this kind of stuff, 
there's always the argument of people saying, oh, it happened to me, so, you know, it's thought I've turned out all right, and so on and so forth. That's normally a bit, you know, debatable, but that's a different conversation. But <laughs> but it's just more the what you've taken there is really important. It's the, the concepts and the values he tried to instill, which you're then sort of adapting to a different, more modern way of sort of parenting and your own interpreting. Because as well, like you are not your dad, you're your own person and you're given your own influence in your own way. And I think that's so important as well because I feel like certain people feel they have to live through their kids or live as their parents or such. So as you, if the fact you've then, as much respect as you had for your dad, I'm sorry to hear about everything, it's good that you've then taken that and then built your own person from there. I mean, that's yeah. really important to really like, you know. Get- what you got to remember is, Dan, what you got to remember is that the reason why people say so like, you know, uh, my dad, uh, my dad, all of his mates back in the 70s, we all go down the pub, come home, uh, throw the dinner on the, don't throw the dinner on the tables, wasn't good enough, knock the missus about and then take it out of the kids. That was very rife in the 70s, not just by my dad, but by everybody, loads of people, right? And, and it is what it was. Now, I agree in part of what he said. Now, um, you said, oh, how you, it's good how you made the change. It's all about conditioning with people, right? Now, people condition, oh, my dad hit my mum, so I'm going to hit my missus, or my dad hit my kids, so I'm going to hit my kids. That's all conditioning. It's the environment you're raised in. You know, um, if you're raised in an environment where you're told you don't like a certain, um, a certain race, shall we say, you're going to grow up in life not liking that that race okay because it's conditioning and and people say oh, you know i can't change because it's what i know of course you can you know if i was anything like my dad i'd be knocking my girlfriend about i'd be down the pub all the time i'd be knocking my kids about but i'm not pub because both. you can sorry <laughs> okay well both but uh but no it is all conditioning dan and it's how open you are to accept change that's what you touched on and um if you I'm mentally tough, mentally strong. That's down to my uh, Marines more than anything else. But yeah, you, if things aren't going right, you repeating that process isn't going to change anything. So you need to take stock, look at the situation and adapt to it. Now, that's where people fall down. And they use that excuse of, oh, that's all I know, or that's how I was raised, or, you know, and it's, uh, personally, I think it's a cop out. You, know, you anyone can change as long as you've got the right mindset for it yeah i think people may interpret I mean, for speaking as a general term obviously it's case by case and specific and stuff but as a whole there is that whole victim mentality kind of thing that if this has happened this is the reason something else can't happen but yeah that's that's not necessarily the case that's your interpretation of it yes i've mm. had my hardship but i'm then doing this it's not oh, I can't do that because I've had my hardship, if you see what I mean, that way of dealing with these certain situations. Exactly, that's exactly what I mean. And, and it's, it's a funny one. I'll tell you what's really interesting here is the Royal Marines are described as thinking soldiers. And yeah. having spoken to a few, including yourself, it's really interesting hearing... It's the, the mindset. It's a very similar concepts. It's a similar sort of structure of overcoming the situation and processing all this information because that's ultimately what it is in... When it comes to the more hostile situations, which we'll probably touch on a bit later on about certain operations or whatever else, that the it's dealing with not even just the volume of stuff, but the value of it, how threatening this information can be, how detrimental it can be, and all this stuff whilst it's all going on as well. Because there's just so much to break down. I mean, dissecting how your emotions were in like high intense situations how you process that information whilst retaining not only your skills you've learned, but your leadership skills, all this kind of stuff. It's so intricate. And it's just, it, we can go on for hours talking about this kind of thing. Yeah. And we might have to, but. <laughs> yeah. um, so so what's, what's actually a question? Not so much a question as such. Like I said, being a bit of a podcast, it's meant to be a bit more sort of going off on tangents and explaining certain yeah. elements, but it's more just, just because there's a lot of things in there that I could jump in on, but I didn't know if you wanted a specific answer for something. So, Well, we'll go into the thinking soldier element of things. So say yeah. what part of that is instilled? Is that something you feel is built into you before you've even stepped into the Marines? No. Or is it something you've been uh, developed? Right. So you get this, you get a stereotypical, uh, you get people, sorry, who have an idea of a stereotypical Marine, right? 
I'm going to, I'm just going to tell a bit of a backstory first. Uh, I remember when I, I joined the Marines, uh, everyone, because I was only a skinny little lad. I was... Um, I remember five, that. Oh, yeah, sorry. But no, I was, I was only five foot eleven, and and uh, what was I? Uh, 11, five foot eleven and eleven stone eleven when I joined. When I left, I was six foot one and uh, seventeen stone ten. So that was twenty years down the line. So I didn't stop growing until about twenty. But when I joined up, everyone was going, "Oh, you won't make the Marines," because they all they saw was this Jamie guys who got in trouble or this skinny little lad or whatever. Oh, you won't make it. All the Marines are massive. And um, you know, and that's the, that's people were telling me, "Oh, you won't make it. You won't make it. You won't make it." It's not when I was at school. You know, you're not going to pass this. You're not going to pass that. You know, so all these people are pigeonholed you for things. And uh, so when I joined, because yeah, because I, I had minimal uh, C, I had three. I, you needed three C grade GCSEs to join the Marines at the time. I did, and that's what I had. So joined the Marines, and because uh, at school I'd lost interest in everything. You know, um, bombed out of sixth form, um, and uh, so it was like you won't make it, won't make it. But because I'm a reasonably a reasonably smart guy, um, I said I, I I rolled into it really nicely. And they just, they, they are, you hit it right on that, they are thinking soldiers. That's it, they're, well, they're, they're the most elite fighting force in the world for a start. But that's what cuts them above the rest of all the other elite soldiers, is because they're thinking men. And now you get going on to what you said about was it still in you before or after? It's, you get some people there who are, you know, who are thick as mints. You do, you really do. But they're exceptional soldiers. They'll never be a leader, they'll never be a thinker, they'll never be able to plan a, a a operation or plan a route to do whatever, but they will follow you, do what they're told, and be excellent at what they do. So you need that. You need everybody in there. But as a rule, they are thinking man. Um, and you go into your leadership courses as you go, pretty much like you would do on any any job. You know, you get promoted. And the Marines leadership courses are very cut and dry. You know, you get one attempt, one attempt only. Now. Um, depending on how you go, you may get a second. Well, what, and I would say one attempt, one attempt only. If you're borderline with everything, right, you probably won't get another go, right? If you're excelling at everything and you fail one thing, then they'll give you another go, all right? Um, and you learn with experience. You know, you start off as a Marine where you, you're following your last corporal, corporal sergeant, and you're picking up things that they do. And then you get promoted eventually to Lance Corporal where you're leading some men but under the direction of your corporal and sergeant. Then you get promoted to Corporal where you're leading all your team, then sergeant, and you're leading loads of different people. So it's all a step by step, you know, um, but they, but as a rule of thumb, um, I could give you as my Marine a job to say, right, uh, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go from point A to point B and do this. And I should give you a map and you'll plan it plan the, the route, plan the operation. Um, so, yeah, so we should all be able to do that in the Marines. But like I said, some, some can't. Another thing you touched on there I thought was really interesting is about people with different skill sets, with different sort of intellects. Because where things I feel get lost in translation a lot of the time is people don't get grades, they think they're stupid. Whereas a lot of, I feel, knowledge is applicable. The way certain elements that appeal to certain things, it's like the whole Einstein thing that if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree as its intelligence, you're, you know, got a problem somewhere. Yeah. And, yeah, and exactly. that's kind of with that, though, because like you said, you didn't do overly well in school. You got what you needed to get in and you weren't interested. Mm -hmm. So on face value, you haven't got those qualifications. Does that mean you're stupid? No, of course not. You're getting stuck in with the Marines. You're adapting your interests and your skills and your energy. And I feel that's where people, especially nowadays, if they're not getting their initial grades at school, but you're purely vocational anyway, they use it as a value measurement of that themselves as a intellectual. And you don't have to be you know, mentor and all this kind of stuff. You can just apply your skills and apply your knowledge and apply your traits, which I thought was really interesting. The thing is, in the Marines, I'm sure it's like, I, I can't tell you about the Army, the RAF and the Navy because I have no interest in them. You know, my interest with my what I did. If they work for us, they work for us, fine. So I can't tell you what they do, but in the Marines, you've got education courses all the time. You know, if you're, say, if you go, like, in 1997, we did a nine-month deployment around the world, which incorporated the Hong Kong handover, like the Chinese government, and so the first part of it, 
you were always on board um, a ship that took us on board HMS Fearless. So we got every year on ship on sea for two weeks at a time before you stop at any destination. So in that two weeks, in the evening, education courses were run. So I'm just picking this as an example, by the way, Dan. So you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean. You're not doing anything. So what do you do? Okay, I'll go do an education course. So, you know, you, I've got my, uh, you get your maths, you get your, your English, you get your biology, you get your, everything else. Whatever you want to achieve, if you want to do it, it's there for you. Um, so you've got guys like me walking out of a degree, you know, um, A-levels, whatever, diplomas, whatever it is, from leaving school with pretty much nothing. Um, so even, so to your point, you're right. You don't need that education to to go further in life. You know, I mean, all the stuff I've got doesn't, doesn't yeah, it helps me in my own personal life, but doesn't help me in what I do. And I run a business. You know, so it's it yeah. is isn't interesting the sort of value we give these kind of vocational qualifications. And yeah. the, the especially society now, how we measure success and measure value and and all the rest of it, because it's so easy in like world of social media to say, oh, they've got this, that, and the other. They're a better person, or they're, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. It's so easy to get sucked into that. But it's um, instead of signing, where's your value? Is it in the goal you're achieving, or is it the acclamation you get from it on Instagram? So if we just head back to um where we were, so timeline wise, so you've just finished. Was it how many weeks was it in your introduction? Uh, well, the Marines. Potential recruits course is a week long. That's where you pass or fail to get in. And the Marines it, training is nine months long. So it's uh, nine months at a place called Commando Training Centre down in uh, Limpston in Devon, quite near near Exmouth. Lovely part of the world. Lovely part of the world. It's on uh, the River X. Great scenery, but you never appreciate it because you're always crawling through the mud, uh, you know, getting shouted at. Living in it. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. So that was that's nine months long, uh, nine hard long months. So talk us through like the month. Obviously, not in too much detail because obviously I'm not sure what you can and can't say with stuff. But so what what does a normal week look like for you, training wise and routine? Okay, so if you imagine day one, week one, first two days are pretty. Apart from the guys shouting at you and you having to run around like a lunatic everywhere, um, first day and a half, two days are quite relaxed. You just go and get photos like your passport, your ID card, get your hair cut, uh, get all jewelry stores, get your kit shown where everywhere is on camp. Um, and then after that, mate, my first six weeks were just a blur. I, I couldn't really tell you much about the first six weeks because my head was on my ass. Um, but after that, what you go through different phases. So the first six weeks are really trying to level everybody out, you know, so I got, I went in there as fit as I could be, as you get other people in there who aren't as fit as me. So the first six weeks is used to level everyone out. So the, the you bring each other to the same sort of standard. And it doesn't, doesn't work hundred percent, but it brings everyone up and down. So everyone works together well. Um, and then after week six, you just start going into more soldier inside of things. Loads of loads of phys physical training, like you wouldn't believe, mate. The physical training, if you love fizz, if you take out the military element, you take out the shouting and screaming, it's it's awesome. And that's the sort of stuff I do at my boot camp. The military, if you, the physical stuff's brilliant, I love that. But you learn all your map reading, your soldiering skills, all that sort of stuff. Then go to week thirteen onwards, you go down onto where the assault course is. You start doing all your assault course work. Um, and you start doing all your commando training, like what what is it was perceived as commando training, all the sneaky sort of stuff. Uh, which then uh, by week week 30, 32, uh, you go into your commando tests. So which is an accumulation of all your training. Um, and it's done. How the programs run, it's done so you're on your lowest step. So you've got your hardest tests to do when you're broken. Uh, it's all about state of mind, which is what their their mantra is, and which is what my mantra is for my business. So it's to make see how mentally tough you are, because I've seen guys who are superbly fit and amazing creatures, but fail at the first obstacle because they're not mentally strong enough. And likewise, I've seen people who are like what I was, a skinny little lad, who just smashed everybody, you know, because they've got it up top. So. so Sorry, just to go through a few of those things there. So that structure you've laid up there, is, are you aware of this structure going into it? Do you get told, okay, this is the first sort of week we're going to do, this is the next sort of phase? And yeah. after the fact, do you get graded on these certain things? 
Yeah, well, basically, first, you can't leave. Um, sorry, you can voluntary... What's it called? Um, PVR, it's called, I believe. You can leave voluntary within the first four weeks. So if you don't like something, you don't like some big nasty man shouting at you, then you can say, right, I opt out to go home. So you can, you go, you know, they just kick you out. And then after four weeks, you can't leave. You've got to stay in until either you pass or until they kick you out themselves and not be good enough. Um, and so um, as, as you go on, as you go on, you adapt and get better and better and better and better and better. Um, damn, what was the question again? I'm just, I'm just completely confused myself. That's not a problem at all. So it's more the sort of structure of your training when you go into it, if you're aware of the actual physical structure you're going into. Oh, God. Yeah, and yeah, on top yeah. of that, is it graded like piece by piece? Do you get oh, aware of how it's going on? Yeah, that, that's, so yeah, that's what I was going to say. So the first four weeks, it's, it's just getting used to military life. You can leave if you want. Then after sort of week four, you have uh, military exercises. Uh, like five days long, six days long, where you go out, say on Woodbury Common or Dartmoor, you live there for five days a week, learning military skills and putting them into practice. And you'll have a, a four mile speed march on, on the way home, which will be tested. And if you fail the four mile speed march, you'll get what's called what's called back treat. And then they start adding all these tests in after week four. So before you know it, you're doing um, uh, written exams. You're doing uh, observation exams, you know, you're doing all sorts of bits and pieces that everything's then being marked. And if you don't make the grade, then you're going to get back trooped again. And then after sort of like week 13, when you're on, the, when you go what's called the bottom field, which is your salt course, it just all ramps up to pretty much everything is pass or fail. Um, so yeah, you be, you, you always have a, a written report written on you every week, you know, recruit gloss. Um, and you've got, you've got all your attributes, you know, like you see on these on these on these football games, you know, speed, strength, whatever. And you've got all them, all your attributes down, you know, with map reading, drill, physical stuff, blah 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 blah. And you're marked. And if you're a shit bloke, uh, i.e., don't gel with everybody else, don't matter how good you are, they'll see that and they'll get rid of you. Or if you're not at the required level, they will back troop you. You know, cause every, and all they do, they go back to these mark, these this marking system, look like a report book, and say, right, yeah, recruit gloss isn't up the standard. They'll have a meeting, and they'll have a meeting with the head of the the wing. The wing is the person, the the, the, air, the group that controls training, right? They'll have a meeting with the wing, and then they'll decide whether to get rid of him or not. Uh, so yeah, everything's graded, everything's marked, but after week thirteen, it's all pass or fail. So what was the general atmosphere like throughout the training, obviously, with all these other guys? Because is it building the camaraderie almost? Is it almost trying to size each other up, see who's going to last? So how did yeah, you feel going yeah. in? You get, you, get, you get the duty hard person all the time, don't you? Some got noise, and there's no disrespect to Northern, there's a lot of Northerners. But it's always someone from, normally from Manchester who thinks they're the hardest man in the world. And, oh, mate, all the time. And uh, they come down, and it's interesting to see how they get put into their place, you know, because um, Marines aren't after hard men. They will, they will, they will breed hard men. They're not after, just because you, just because you're a Marine doesn't make you hard. Just because you're a hard man doesn't mean you're going to be a Marine. It's, you know, what's hard about a Marine is the mental capability, you know, not, not how, how hard you can punch somebody. And so these guys who, come in with uh, I'm this, I'm that and stuff, you know, trying to threaten people, they get weeded out. And you normally find these people will, if they stay, become very quiet and mix in with the rest of the group quite quickly. Um, yeah, so the camaraderie side of things, after that shit happens, and that happens quite a lot in the first six weeks, like people are just like, um, you know, I've got a bigger chest than you, no, you haven't this, I have, you know, it's just like cock measuring. And then once like, the reality of training kicks in, everyone works together, and if they don't work together, it's like I said, they'll, the, the training team who take you through, they will see that and they will get rid of them. Um, so, yeah, camaraderie is built from the beginning, but you start working as teams really you know, really early on from the six-week phase. Um, but the problem you have with recruit training, so like I, was, I was good, so I'd have my group of people 
I mean, there's other people who weren't so good who'd be in their little group. And so you wouldn't, it wouldn't be a fair comparison, you know. So if you're no, if you're no, if you're average, there's no one in your team pulling you along, you know, you're staying average. Uh, as like when you leave recruit training, it's completely different, you know. It's, it's hard, it's hard to explain. Um, you know, you, 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 in as a recruit, you're out to, you're there to look out for yourself, to be honest, and obviously bring as many people along as you can. But ultimately, you're there to pass, not to sacrifice yourself for someone else. Um, and so you get a lot of that. A lot of like, you know, good guys, strong guys stick together, weak guys stick together. Um, it's it's just how it is. But when you leave and pass out and go to a commando unit, it's completely different. You know, completely different. So, yeah, there's a few things to point out from there. So one thing you said at the start, which I really want to touch on, is when you said about being a hard man, like what does it mean? And the same with the term Marine as well. It's it's not an absolute. If you give your definition, it could be different to my definition. It could be different to everyone else's definition. And it's then what does that status mean? And then it's the extra layers to all this stuff as well that does it mean you've got certain like muscle percentage? Does it mean you're this strong? Does it mean you can withstand this, that and the other? There's all these yeah. different quote unquote measurements for this like up in the air terminology. Whereas you know to get it, point of being a marine it means you've if nothing else you've passed the requirements to you know get in and do what you need to do yeah. as a base standard so that has got more weight to it because you've got an actual standard for what that is and then yeah. another thing you touched on there is um about how people can settle almost because the first podcast with mickey used an analogy for the um was it 100 meter dash that if you go with people who aren't as good as you you'll always beat them but if you go with people who are better than you your time will always improve yeah, and, and that kind of idea of that if you're you won't be you'll hold yourself back if you need to or you won't be able to you know progress your sort of coast to try and stay safe almost it's uh it's, that's that's right yeah, you're 100 correct you know um if you want to be a big fish in a small pond then you stay in that small pond don't you you know if you're every day is a school day you're always learning you know i know my job like you know yours i know my job inside out inside out back to front but I'm always learning. I'm always looking for ways to improve, you know, and it's, it's you've got to take on board what other people say. Now, with, uh, not Mickey's analogy there, but you're right, if you, if you want to stay at that level and you're happy beating the people who are no good, that's where you're going to stay, you know, and to get a better version of yourself, you've got to keep pushing, haven't you? And you don't, you don't get anywhere in life if you just want to stay. But this is the problem you've got. You've now, you've now tr uh, triggered me to my pet hate. This is what we've got in our society. We've got too many people who think they deserve something and they're not prepared to work for it. That's the problem you've got, right? You don't get what you don't deserve. You don't, you know, if you don't deserve it, you're not going to get it. You've got to work to get it. You know, you've got to work hard on yourself on what you do, whether it's uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever it is. You can't... You can't just expect it, and that's that's the issue you, I have with today. But um, anyway, that's sidestepping from from the actual from the actual question. Um, to be a marine, you've got to be you've got to have, you've got to be smart. You don't have to be intelligent, but you've got to be smart. You've got to be able to think on your feet. All right, you've got to be able to listen to orders. You've got to be able to put these orders into practice. You've got to be able to perform under duress. Um, you know, it's you've got to be physical, um, and all these together, you know, will make a marine. Now, it's it's like people think, oh yeah, you know, he's not a marine; he's too small, mate. As I said earlier, some of the hardest men and fittest and strongest and best soldiers I've ever seen have been have been small, you know, small people or smaller. You know, you can't you can't judge a book by its cover. But I will tell you now, the marines. Are by far the most elite soldiers in the world. Worked with them for twenty years. They're amazing creatures. So adaptable. So adaptable to anything they do. You put them in any single position uh, or environment, and they will come out on top. And I, I will bet my house on that every day of the week. Again, there's so many things to dissect in these things. It's why it's such an interesting conversation. It's why I love having you on so far. It's been really good. Um, so let's go into a few of those points. So the first thing about what you're saying, people deserving things, because I know you that's hit a nerve, and whilst we're there, we might as well twist that nerve a little <laughs> bit. 
so there's a, a concept of again it's like what does deserve mean what what do you feel you you've earned as such you've done what to earn this what accolade and this kind of thing and then it's what i was saying earlier about people assigning value and other sort of things that as a this is it is so funny is that how you then define who's worth what and what is value and all this kind of stuff and then this false sort of sense of i don't know i think it goes back to the victim mentality thing as well that i deserve yeah. all your same accolades without the same input because you know because what <laughs> i know it's, it's crazy you know um so like i i do some work um uh, for a company called reactivate which is uh uh, run by a lady called Michelle Downer. Great lady, husband Conroy Downer. I'm not sure if you know the boxer, Mickey, you know him. And um, brilliant, brilliant people. And um, I've done a few courses like this for the physical sort of stuff. Room. And she asked a question to the group. She always had, like, you have adult offenders, young offenders, uh, people with drug issues, that sort of stuff. You know, so like a, um, a, um, a kid, sort of like a a key group of people that need that need guidance, right? And she just asks, um, who deserves who deserves the best possible life? You know, and everyone puts hand up whatever and they ask, why do you do why do you deserve it? Why do you deserve it? Now, whatever their reasons were, they're right, everyone deserves the best possible life. Of course they do. You know, you, you don't deserve a shit life. But you don't deserve to take pass an exam if you don't do the work for it. You don't deserve that job if you don't prepare for the job. You don't, you know, it's... Be, oh, um, I didn't one know second, Dan, just turn the Alexa off. She always kicks in. That's <laughs> it. She always got an opinion to charm in with. Yeah, mate, she's horrendous. But, um, no, so, yeah, things like everyone does. Everyone deserves the best possible life they have. But to get that best possible life, you need to work hard for it. You know, and too many people sit back and expect it to come to them. Excuse me, and when it doesn't come to them, they kick off at the moment. You know, and it's I've got no sympathy for them. I don't understand why people are like that. Where it gets really tricky is when adversity sort of comes in. So, prime example, say like me at school, for example, the occasional time I put a lot of effort into an exam, and I don't get the grade I thought I deserved. Yeah. Then, then what? So then, then it's that kind of oh. I thought I've done everything and then the result isn't there and then then what but then it's what else is needed in terms of that wasn't what was needed is then reassessing these things and that kind of you're you're a fighter when you lost your first fight when you lost your first fight did you go fuck this I'm not doing this again or did you go right I know what I've done wrong I need to improve on that I did both <laughs> I, had a big, I had a big cry yeah. I had a big soul I thought okay let's go on with it let's sort it out that's your initial reaction to everybody Every, most people do that when they're new to stuff but after your reflection do you think right this is what I'm going to do you know you did you got better hence look where you are now if you didn't sat back and go oh, fuck this it's pointless well where's your improvement coming from you know you're not, you're not going to get anything now are you So, but you can still sit there and say well I deserve to win that fight but you didn't, you lost, what are you doing about it? Nothing. Well, you know, it's your, it, there you go. So you, you you lost, you trained harder, you, you, you cleared up your faults, and you and you progressed and you won. And that's the same with anything. It's just the people, failure is not, failure is not a bad thing, Dan. You know, people think, oh, I can't fail. Well, everyone fails, that's how you learn, isn't it? You know, so people shouldn't be afraid of failing, unless, right, if you fail in the Marines, you get kicked out. But you can always reapply and go again if you want to put yourself through it. You know, it's it's not the end of the world failing. It's how you it's how you deal with failing. And it's so funny when people say like, "Oh, failure is not an option. You've got to succeed." As a... No, it 100 percent is an option. And there's people like famous fighters and other people who say it's a ready, ready, uh, readily available option. It's just there all the time. You can quit. You can always give up and stuff. But that's not the point. The point of this always, you know. Find out where your limits are. Find out where your issues are, and then reevaluate. Yeah. And then the concept of saying, "Oh, I deserve it because X, Y, and Z." Mm. Th- what does that mean? <laughs> well, I know, I know, mate. I know. If you deserve it, you'd have got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, mate, even the best people lose or fail. You know, it, 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 we're not we're not machines. But again, it's just about that having that mindset to think. Okay, once you've got past that fucking out process, like you have, I had, and I failed stuff. It's reevaluating yourself and thinking, right, is this the route I want to go down? If it is, 
what do I need to do to improve? You know, and it's, you know, I'm, hey, you know me, Dan. I'm not, I, you know, I don't go knocking on doors selling Bibles, you know, but you've got to have time for reflection on yourself. Right, what do I need to do to get better? You know, if that means, if that means you cutting out certain elements of your lifestyle, i.e. some friends who aren't influential enough or a diet or an exercise, whatever it is, then for you to get that extra 1%, that's what you need to do. Um, it's too easy to just go, ah, get it. Well, that's, that's losing the responsibility for it. Because when you get to these sort of situations, you get to these sort of roadblocks, and then you have to work out what to do at that point. Because, you know, there's all these different elements to everything. But to go back on to where you were, so talk with me through a bit more about your journey in the Marines then. So where were we? So you we say so, you've, you've got your basic training, you're finishing off. Yeah. So they were, where are we now? So training finished, past training. Um, and then I got drafted. Cause you, when you're in there as a recruit, when you get to your sort of later stages, you get you put in a draft in order about where you would like to go to. Um or, you know, so I'd say I put down 40 commando, which is in Taunton. And then I put 4-2 commando as my second preference, which is in Plymouth. And then I put 4-5 commando, which is up in uh, Arbroath in Scotland. Um, or I could have put down, I wanted to go to, um, to be, a, I could want to be a driver. So I put down, I want to do a driver's course. So I'd be a military driver or a clerk or a chef. So, it's up, so you put down your preference. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get that. So I, I, um, I passed that Marines training. I was like top five out of the whole uh, of my team. I got, I got what I got. I got what's called a PT medal, which is like fittest Marine in training. Uh, so I was up there. I was good at what I did. So my, I was always going to get my preference. And forty commander was like the 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 commander unit to go to. They were like the boys. So I went there, and then if I'd have been no good or below average or outside the the top 10 say I'd put for 40 commando but the, the nine guys in front of me got that so I'm now going to my second preference and then if I fall below that I then go to my third preference and then if I fall below that I get just told right you're going to be a driver so that that's how it sort of works so yes yeah, so I went to 40 commando which is in Taunton as I said brilliant brilliant place great part of the world um Nightlife was good. It's not so good much. It's not that good anymore, so I believe. Some of my friends tell me. But it was good when I was there. Anyway, with a contract with the local council, I believe it was, that we had to be out the the, the, the county for six months every year. So 40 Commando were called the Sunshine Commando because they were always away, you know, whether it was jungle training, Mediterranean trips, over in America, going to Norway, where they were always away. Then when you got home, you then go off to say Northern Ireland or Iraq. So for a life for a lifestyle and experience, it's brilliant. But for family time, it was non existent. You could, you know, I, got, I was married twice when I was in the Marines. And when I joined up, the careers office guy said, You'll be married if you stay full term, you you'll be married three times. You know, so yeah, it's not it's not as much as they promote family life, it's not family life lifestyle, that's for sure. I mean, that's something to touch on as well. I mean, this side of... It's more the behind-the-scenes side of like the services as well, of being away in these extended periods of time and all these... This is sort of service... Again, it's just so personal, that kind of thing. And again, it, I don't want to, like, you know, say anything that's... that's I tra- it's more just, like, how can you get in these situations knowing all this is going on? It must be so tricky to try and manage everything else because the top of your initial physical stress of what's going on, your operations and all the other stuff, to then have a relationship to then also worry about getting back to. Because it's almost the case of if you feel that it's just you looking out for you, obviously in your team as well, but yeah. then there's no one necessarily like a family waiting for you back at home. It must add an extra like level of weight to you as such. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, it takes, um, it takes 21 days to form a habit, doesn't it, right? So if you want to change something, you, after, if you stop it for 21 days, you'll start breaking the habit. And it's the same principle with, with being away. Yeah, you you miss your family like crazy. You do, you know, and, you know, people cry all the time. You know, not, I'm not about season Marines. I'm not about when you join you know, recruit training. And it's understandable. But once you get into the swing of things, it's not too bad. And then when you... 
when you're, if you're not, if you're out, if, you, if you're not working, this is when you're a fully fledged Marine. If you're not working, when Friday comes around, you'll go home Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come back Monday. But like, take 97, for example, I was away for nine months. So I said goodbye to like January the 5th and came back uh, just before October, uh, wherever it was. So, but after two weeks of being away, you're into that mindset of work, 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 work. You know, so you don't really, you, you ring them every night or whenever you can, if you've got a sat phone, whatever, but it doesn't bother you anymore. You know, you're there to do a job. You do your job to best your ability. And then when you've got like two weeks to go before you go home, you then start thinking about home again. Um, you go home, you, you, re, you know, you, you re sort of uh, uh, integrate back to your family life. But what is different, Dan, the reason why me and my first wife, Hayley, who's a lovely lady, the reason why we divorced is because we were two different people. So she worked in London for a solicitors. I'd come home. She was six, nine months further on, and I was still where I was six months, nine months ago. Um, so we were on different paths. And what I ended up doing was I ended up just falling out of love with a girl because we were too, we were end up being so different. Um, so that's that that's that's what it, that's what happens. You get loads of guys in Marines who never never go home, never go home, you know, or the other people that move their wives. And family to the to the married quarters, which is around the camp environment, which is near where the camp is. Uh, so they're home every night, you know. Because you think about it, I was based in Plymouth, Taunton, Scotland. You know, the, the shortest journey for me is 200 miles. You know, and I can't go home unless it's a weekend, and that is if we're not working that weekend. So yeah, it's you just get used to it, mate. And unfortunately, the family life suffers hugely. Uh, but at the time. You don't see it like that, you know, because you're there to do a job which you enjoy. Um, but, like, looking at I've got a 17-year-old son, and uh, it, it's basically his first 10, 11 years, I, was a, I, was, I never, never really saw him. I was a part-time dad. And, but at the time, it never bothered me. It did bother me. That's wrong. It, it did. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know you meant with that, yeah. Um, you know, and now, when people ask me about the Marines, 100%, I'd always do that Marines, but I would... But you know, I want I, I would want to be a better dad, you know, because I missed all them things that are important, like his like uh, his first step and all that sort of stuff, his first words, and, you know. Um, but that unfortunately is the price you pay for doing the job you do, and that's just not in the Marines. That's any military life. There's like, so many things that I suck with this. I mean. One thing I really wanted to ask about is that transition. So, you know, the whole thing that after you leave the services and go back to being a civvy and stuff, yeah. is that's quite, you know, a heavy transition for a lot of people. But yeah. the almost intermittent in-betweens, like coming back at the weekends and stuff, and then trying to readjust again, because you spent all this time getting desensitized to, you know, normal life, to into this now hostile life as such, like a better choice of words. Yeah. And then going back to being normal for a weekend or so, and then coming back again. Like, what was that kind of transition like? Uh, obviously... <laughs> you're never normal when you come back for a weekend. Weekend is just, I'll tell you what the weekend consisted of for me, early years, right? I'd come home, uh, play, come home on a Friday night, uh, play, rug, play rugby on a Saturday, go out with a rugby lad Saturday night, play football Sunday morning, uh, have a beer, one beer or two beers with a, uh, footballers, go home, go to bed, then leave for work early hours Monday morning. That's how the weekend was all the time. So I never really did. Friday night was my family night. You know, everything else was just me doing what I was doing. But that's because the, the how I was programmed with the Marines. It was, it was, I had a plan and I was sticking to this plan and format. When it, looking in hindsight, what I should have done is had, say, Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Sunday, family time, and, and Saturday every now and then had gone out, but that was never the case. Um, so weekends were fine. You know, you, you were never there long enough. And, well, this is me personally speaking. You were never there long enough to sort of desensitize, you know, to slip back into normal life. But what what you said there is a good good thing to say, because when I when I did leave, I still got medically discharged, discharged after 20 years. Um, I, I, did, I went and worked... Once I was healed and better, I went to work out in Iraq because I knew I would be no good 
going straight into civvy life because I, I would because civvies are a strange bunch, you know. Um, you know, like we just spoke about the the the, the need to deserve something for not working for it really pisses me off. Um, and a lot of civvies, uh, not everyone, because a lot of civvies will stitch you up, even though they're your friend. And I, 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 I can't understand that either. So I knew I'm going to struggle with that. So I did a, a, did a year hostile close protection work um, where I was away for eight weeks, nine weeks, home for three weeks or four weeks. But every one of those weeks I was home, three or four weeks, I had to be out of the country. So I'd be on hot so I was on holiday all the time. But that was my integration into normal life, having a two, three week block every eight weeks or so. Um, but I'm not gonna lie to you, when I set my boot camp up, the first year, the first year, and probably a little bit longer, was horrendous. Horrendous. Because you've got all these normal people who aren't military trained, who aren't regimented, who don't listen to instruction, who uh, don't understand timekeeping. Um, you know, you're trying to train them. And during the, the hour, you're as professional as you like. But after the hour, you're thinking, Jesus Christ, I can't do this anymore. You know, and it's so hard to get back into normal life. Um, because you don't, when I left, and I, I had a traumatic injury, so there was even more need for me to have a build yourself slowly into civilian life sort of course, whatever they call it. Nothing happened. It was like, okay, this is your t this is your TX date, this is your leaving date. You can go and leave now until that day, come back on that day and you're discharged. So there was no and you know, what you do in your time off is up to you. So there's no one looking after you. So you've gone from being a a fully bled, fully fledged Royal Marines commando, you know going around kicking down doors and shooting stuff to being a Joe Civvy on the street, you know, literally overnight. And it's, you can't comprehend, you know, I know, I know normal, normal Joe Civvy doesn't understand the military role. And I know you guys in the military struggle massively with that because, you know, people expect you to leave the military and be normal, but you, you, you can't, you know, and it's, you know, the best analogy for it, mate, I was talking, if you imagine you're in the military, you're you driving the middle lane because you're told, right, you need to go from A to B, these are your daily orders, that's what you've got to go. So you go, I'm going to drive down the middle lane. And then you've got all these people going from the first lane to the third lane, third lane to the second to the first, all over the place. And it pisses you off because they're they're not doing they're not structured. They're getting in your way, they're doing their own thing. And but to them, that's normal. You know, as to me or other military guys that leave, that's not normal. So that's where the clash comes from. But, you know, you, you get used to it after a while. Some people don't, and that's very sad, but you get used to it after a while, it's fine. I mean, there's a few things in there as well. Like, I think one under one underappreciated part of, like, leaving the... Well, again, I'm speaking on just pure speculation. I haven't got personal experience in this, and, you know, I'm not going to pretend I do. But one thing I would have thought would be quite a, an issue for a lot of people would be going from that sort of camaraderie with these people who, you, you know, you died for, to then pretty much on your own or back to family life and then you know it's just trying to replicate that it must be even more like like lonely and stuff it, it is it is i mean i um but this goes back to you know I'm, I'm mentally strong so i'm good yeah my marine friends especially ones i was in combat with uh you will die for 100 percent. you know and you will do absolutely anything for and uh, it's no exaggeration you know and when you come home, you've got some good friends, you know, of course you have. Um, and, you know, you, you, you've got a, a lot of people that, that you like and talk to, and you know, but no one will be the same as that person who stood by your side when you're, say, in Afghan, Iraq or Africa or wherever you're doing. Because uh, the person who stood next to you knows you, you know, and he's done the same as you so that you can relate to each other. And, he, and he's willing to put his life on the line for you. As when you when you come home, you, the best you can the best you can hope for your friends is for them to be on time. You know, um, it's so it's so different. But you get used to it. As I said, you get used to it, mate. Um, the camaraderie, yeah, you miss it. Everyone who leaves the service, no matter what service you're in, will say, will say that I miss the lads because they're all like minded people. They all love fizz. They all love training. They all love hard work, they, they all do anything for each other, you know, um, and you all go out for a drink together and, you know, do whatever. Uh, as when, you know, being a normal person, 
that doesn't happen. You know, but it doesn't mean they're not they're not, they're not good friends. Of course, they're good friends of mine, but they're just different to my marine friends. You know, so it's fine. Um, it, 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 you get used to it after a while. You know, I feel it's quite tricky again with this sort of categorising thing of oh, I'm a marine, I'm a civvy, we are different people. Whereas I feel that almost incites that exclusion almost voluntarily because you're instead of like trying to fit back in you're then trying to put a square in a round peg almost yeah. you see what i mean I, yeah i was at first dan trust me i was the first year to, well mate it went on for longer i've been outside six years now um whatever it is the first i would say the good first three years that's what i was doing trying to put a square peg in a round hole you know um it wasn't until uh, I'll tell you what, it wasn't until I got diagnosed, I got diagnosed with PTSD, you see, like many other people. And it wasn't until I I got that, then got the the uh, British Legion, did some counselling with me, and then got sorted out for medication in bits and pieces. Um, it wasn't until that point that I then realised that I got to train myself to, be, to, to work in a different way. Now, what all that meant was, the only reason I say the PTSD thing is because if I hadn't had PTSD, I think it would have took me longer to figure out the square peg round hole scenario. The reason the PTSD happened because I was talking to the, the Royal British Legion and they were making me challenge myself on different things. And it just, made, it just clicked, it just made me realise that I need to still be me still be, you know, the core of me doesn't change. Me being me will never change, but I need to be more open and adaptable to everybody else, you know. You know, just, you know, we've spoken in the pub before, Dan. You said about me come down to the MMA, and I'd love to do it, because I did a bit like that stuff in the Marines. But, you know, I was never, I, I never had the time to do it. And if you'd have forced the point, Dan, oh, come on, come down, come down, come down, I'd just, gone, I'd have just left you. You know, probably told you, uh, right, fuck off, and I uh, walked away because it got to it annoyed me because I already told you I'm not going to do it or whatever I said. But now you just got to go, okay, yeah, I made it. You know, you've got to understand how life works, and um, you know, you can't keep squeezing that square peg in that round hole because all you're going to do is get yourself in bother and push people away. I think that's where certainly I get this mixed up sometimes when you try and you find something that works for you. And then you try and help other people see what you've seen, but without the understanding that they've got their own experiences and own interpretations and also their own preferences and things. Because as much as where you've got your own things to give to other people, they might, may not want to see it the same kind of way and that kind of sort of thing. But one yeah. thing I want to touch on just there is how when you were diagnosed with PTSD, how were you when you were you quite accepting of it when you were told about were you quite against it because obviously going from this you know well oiled machine this thinking mm. soldier to almost to vulnerable i want to say you've had you've been you know you've gone from being the runt of a group to being this well oiled thinking soldier to then almost i don't know having it taken away from you almost to an extent like you've then i'll tell you what right it's it's very misunderstood now i'm going to speak openly about this because you know um it's the only way. It's the only way to be with this situation. Um, a lot of people. There's a lot more people now who have cognitive issues, right? Whether it's anxiety, uh, PTSD, depression, whatever. But a lot of people um, don't understand what the difference is. All right. And with PTSD, with my PTSD, uh, now PTSD can come on from anything. I think they're trying to rename it combat post-stress disorder now. But because PTSD can come on from anything, car crash, you know, being abused, whatever. Um, but with me, excuse me, as what my what my members at Commander Group Fitness, the ones that have been there from the beginning, will tell you, I over a period of about a year or so, I started getting de- um, uh, separated, shall we say, from the group. In fact, that rather than talk to them at the beginning and at the end of the session, I wouldn't. I'd go off by myself. Um, play around with the circuit, then do the session, which was great, all singing, all dancing, and then when the session finished, I'd go. You know, as that was with me, it was before, I'd always have a laugh and a joke with the guys before and after. 
And um, it was I was up, uh, I was going to have a girl for a girl called Sarah Britton, who was an absolutely amazing girl, brilliant girl. And um, we weren't getting on. And I, I was, you know, I down somewhere. So we went, we went over a chat with a counsellor to say that, you know, can you give us some advice? And the lady goes, I think you're suffering from PTSD. I can't help you. So I thought, really? No. But then that played on my mind a little bit. I thought, oh, yeah, my, 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 my. So I got in contact with the British Legion, and yeah, I got diagnosed with PTSD. Um, but if I hadn't or gone with that step with Sarah, then I never would have found out. Well, not then. And I believe it would have got so much worse. Like my, some of my mates are in a real bad way. It was so much worse because I got the help early and it was really, really great from British Legion. And I got put on the right medication. It didn't take me too long to get the right medication because you got to play around with it for six weeks at a time. Uh, so I've been on the meds now for about a year and a bit and it's fine. I'm perfectly fine. I mean, I'm not, you know, it all, all what happens to me because I am temperamental anyway uh, in the fact that, you know, I can be happy as Larry one minute and then you've pissed me off and then I'll get pissed off for you and then I can be happy as Larry again after that. So I am up and down. But what, what the tablets do, they control that urge to overreact too quickly, you know. So like, I never, you know, I was never sad. I was never crying. I was never wishing to kill myself or anything like that. Like you get some people do. I was just getting very down in the fact that I'm pissed off. You know, not down as normal cry, but I was getting very down and pissed off. And it was affecting everything, everything. And I didn't see it. You know, it's affecting my work, which I love dearly, is and I love the people that go there. It was affecting my relationship, which ultimately that relationship actually finished because of, not because of that, but that was the massive factor. Um, and it was just affecting everything. But like I said, getting it sorted was the best thing I ever did because I'm back to normal. I still take the tablets one a day and uh, I'm laughing. You know, I'm good. But you get people that aren't. And that's, and that's, and that's sad to see. I really appreciate you um, opening up about that, mate. I just- I couldn't even imagine what that would have been like to go through as well. And I think a huge part of that to really take from that is being prepared to be that vulnerable position to be, okay, this, I'm got a problem here. I don't know how to solve it. Can someone help me please? I mean, that, that is a really big step for a lot of people, especially coming from that kind of background of, you know, we've got this exterior, we're all, you know, men look out for each other and all this kind of stuff to then being open about it. And as a touch on that as well, to sort of expand on it a bit more is, a lot of people who sort of suffer from various like, mental health things, not necessarily PTSD, but other sort of mental health issues, a lot of it doesn't always come in the sort of traditional kind of, you know, like crying and the woe is me kind of thing. It's more, uh, you can, again, like anger and other sort of things like that. It's something you don't even notice you're doing to some extent. That's exactly right. Exactly right, Danny. Exactly right. That's, that's what's going on with me. And then, because again, it's just so hard to then take that step. So a lot of, respect for that i've got off before we even carry on so sort of thank you for your service because all this sort of stuff that you've gone through as well it's <laughs> i can't even conceive half of it uh, this this is something that people are getting better at but again people can always even improve on this is giving respect to people who have served and continue to serve because it's a huge commitment i mean whether or not they're actually towards doing it is one thing or another but the fact you're going out there and you've done what you've done i mean it takes I mean, a lot of that's brilliant you said that. I mean, I, I wish it, it's not too bad, but there's, it's getting better. It's still not great. But the thing is, it's not just, it's not just you serving your country, right? It's the fact you, I was married twice. You know, if I wouldn't have been in the Marines, I'd never have got divorced. I'd have been happily married. But, you know, it's all the fallout things. I'm not blaming anybody for this. It's, it's all me. I chose it. But I, you know, I didn't see my son grow up. I was married twice. I, uh, I, you know, which meant I lost my house, so I gave it to the, the, the wife. Had it. Um, I left the Marines broken. You know, I, I, I had twelve operations. Um, I had P- uh, PTSD. You know, it's so all these fallout things that people don't see. You know, and the pay's the pay's crap. You know, I was a twenty-year sergeant, and I was on sort of thirty-five grand a year. You know, and it's it's for the job you're doing. It, it's, it's it's nothing. Um, but you don't do it for that. You do it because you love the job. You know, as I told you, I didn't have a clue who they were, and I had no idea what was going on. But as soon as I found my feet, that was me. This was the job for me. You know, I wanted a dagger between my teeth, crawling through the dirt, 
doing the job. I wanted that, and that's what I got, you know. Uh, and, you know, yes, all these downsides are bad, but I've had my perfect job. You know, who, who around here, around what, where we are, can say that? You know, I, it was a pleasure for me to go to work every day. Uh, that is something so important as well because the amount of people who would then say i don't know what i want to do or i feel like i'm under not achieving my potential but for you then to then say you've had that job you've had that dream Mm -hmm. but this brings me on to my next point about what is what was the step afterwards then so because you've then hit this peak almost of this is where you wanted to achieve you achieved basically what you wanted to do in life but but then what well i did I got discharged in October, October 1st, I got discharged. And um, I was put on, say, furlough, is a good way to say it, it's a very problem right now, on, in the February. In February. And uh, so I was due my second hip replacement in uh, in March, I think it was beginning of March, uh, something like that, anyway. So I had my first hip replacement in the September, and the second one was due over in February or March, whichever way it was. So I was put on leave, gardening leave, until my end date, October the 1st. And then so I'm like, but in that time, from getting my second hip replacement done, which was, say, in March, till October, I got myself reasonably fit again. You know, I mean, you know, nowhere near what I would, ever, I would never be as fit as I was, because obviously I've had both hips in place, broke my back, four knee operations, shoulder surgery, elbow surgery, all from one incident. And... Um, so you're going to be restricted, but I still was the best version of myself. So what I did, I got myself fit enough to go do the uh, private military contracting work out in Iraq, which is a hostile environment stuff. Uh, did that for a little while, got some money saved, um, but then decided to go to Vegas and blow it all, which was, all, which was awesome, by the way. If you ever get the opportunity to spend thousands of money, thousands of pounds in Vegas, just do it. It's absolutely the best thing ever until you come home and realise you've got no savings left. Um, but for them five days, you know, you were you were like a millionaire. It was awesome. Um, and then I always had a plan of going back to Africa and doing some work in Africa because it was good money there. But um, the week before I was going to go to Africa, I stupidly had a game of rugby for a Mickey Mouse rugby league team that are a nothing team. I thought I'd have a game, and I got injured by the. The, the smallest guy on the pitch, he tackled me and he ruptured, uh, not ruptured, just tore my cartilage. Um, so that was on the Saturday and I was going to be flying on the Wednesday to Africa. So I couldn't go, so I lost a contract. So I was, because um, once you leave the military, by the way, you don't get looked after. You don't like, when I had my hips on, I'll get first, you know, A1 healthcare, it's perfect. You leave the military, you go to the back of the queue and, you know, and the NHS are awesome, as we all know, but you go to the back of the queue and so look, you've got the best doctors that you can get hands on doing your surgery in the Marines. When you come here, you've got someone who you won't trust to put a plaster on your hand, you know? Uh, so so with that, I, there was a massive long queue of waiting, sorry, shall I say, to have my knee surgery, which is sort of like six months, I think it was. So I had to do some job, and this company called Regiment Fitness, which are an outdoor boot camp, they run me up, messaging asked me to go down to work for them. And it was all right, actually, because it made me think, actually, because I was going to set up a gym, you see, Dan, that's what I originally was going to do. I thought, actually, I'm going to do this. And um, so I did a few months of regiment fitness, got from myself fit again, then set my own business up in May, May the 19th, 2014. And that is a close run thing in job satisfaction to the Marines, what I do now. It's amazing. The people that go are amazing. And it's because of their people that I enjoy what I do so much. You know, they're, they're brilliant. And I've, I've got over 100 people. Uh, they all come down. They're all different varying levels of ability, but they all love it, you know. And that you can't ask for anything better. Well, definitely. That's why it comes across, especially the way you're, when you talk about it, the way, genuine passion you've got for it. And a few things to sort of talk through on that is, um, obviously lockdown, sort of preventing various things, going on now with it yeah but remember you did a couple of wars at wolf runs tough mudders and stuff with them I and mean, that kind of to get people who previously weren't that like fit or even that interested in fitness to then do something quite out of their comfort zone must have been quite yeah. a rewarding experience mate i i could i'll be honest with you dan 
I've got a big smile on my face. I could sit here and talk your legs off about this because I'm so proud of them. These guys are amazing. You've got, I'm sure she won't mention, I'll just mention her first name. There's a girl called Joy who comes down and I just put a post up about her recently on my Commander Group Fitness page. Um, she was, you know, a, a big girl, right? Now, I don't know exactly, but you're looking at uh, about a size 20, 22, right? And she was really unhappy and she kept coming down, but she was making no, very little improvement because she was so big and so unhealthy and so unfit. Um, and then I was sent telling her about a diet because she's a lovely, lovely lady. I was saying, Joy, you need to sort your diet out. But it falls on deaf ears at times. And then all of a sudden, overnight, it's literally like, right, I need to sort my diet out. So she went to, I think it was uh, Weight Watchers or Slimmer World yeah, in Elso, somewhere like that, I can't remember which one. And she did that, got her diet sorted, carried on training. Mate, she looks amazing now. She's literally, she, I think she's I think she's a, a size 10 to 12 or whatever it is, size 12. She's lost so much size. And it's things like that. It's amazing. And because whilst this was going on, this journey, she started doing, because she, she'd come to the waterfronts, but she'd only watch or take photos because she wasn't confident to do it. But, and you see the difference. The, the, the better she's feeling about herself, the more confident she's getting. And then the next thing you know, she's doing a, um, a wolf run, she's doing um, a Tough Mudder, you know, and she's now doing 10K runs all the time. And it's amazing to see. And it's these guys put the hard work in, and it's great. You, know, you're, you, you orchestrate everything, and you see the results. And I, I can't, I, I cannot tell you how rewarding it is for me seeing these guys, big smiles on their face. I just done a press up challenge with them, right? I do monthly challenges, and I uh, did a press up challenge um, where they do they had four different levels. You could either do 15, 20, 25, or 30 press ups in a minute. So you start off, start on, start stop watch, you bang out your, your 15, 20, 25, or, or 30 press ups. However long it takes you, you then got that rest for the next minute. Then you go again, go again, go again, just to build up press ups to see uh, where where they can what they can achieve from day one to day thirty, and everyone achieved massive massive improvements. And it's just seeing their 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 joy about it, their happiness, their their messages to me saying, oh, "I never thought I could do this. You're amazing." Now this, and it's brilliant to see you know seeing that these guys who didn't think they could achieve something. I've set goals, achieved it, and now go further and further and further. And yeah, in answer to your question, mate, it's so rewarding, you know. And, and that's one of the main. I just love my job. It's that simple. So, there's the one thing I've, that I've sort of picked up. Do you feel like this sort of coach leadership role kind of thing, and yeah. that one that want to build these people up from their potential, they're not necessarily achieving at the minute, comes from your initial reason to join the Marines and going from that want to prove people wrong and that want to go from like i said earlier the sort of run of the group to now this you know imposing leadership figure do you reckon that's part of the um almost as if you're inside my head dan you know that's exactly right exactly right i mate i've got first-hand experience of being written off right i'm sure most people have and some of these people that come to me you know don't want to be there you know they've come because the doctors told them to or because their other half dragged them there. And then when they get the confidence and belief in themselves, when they when when they believe they can actually you know, seeing someone do a full press up for the first time, mate, it's awesome. You know, someone who's never done one before, just doing it's, it's little things like that. And that gives them the the the, the courage and positive attitude and determination to do two press ups and three and four. Next thing you know, they're doing sixty. You know, and it's great. Yeah, it's you can write you can be written off, you can write yourself off. You know, and I, I, I'm not having that with my lot. You know, I'm so I'm not I'm not hard like nasty to them, but I'm a harsh taskmaster. You know, I push them to their capabilities. You now, whether that's one press up or a hundred press ups, that's what they're pushed to, and everyone's different. But they all get the maximum they can out of their bodies, which is why the improvement comes so quickly for them. And you, you see them; they're all happier. They all feel good. They all. You know, it's, I could be here all day talking about it now. Yeah, again, there's a couple of things to dissect from that, like the camaraderie aspect of that, that the sim yeah. not obviously the same, but in a similar mindset of you guys and your know, Marines were built up in the same environment, the same grueling preparations, to which you then go from having your external p 
personalities to being okay we're in this together we're going through this together and afterwards you know we're gonna every operation we're in the same boat so in this yeah. in, a, in a similar sort of statement that yeah. your guys are all going through the same workouts to the same level of their own exertion they're all like okay we're all in the same boat with this there's no competition as such it's more building each other up and i think this is a big part of where people misinterpret sort of these sign these kind of sessions these kind of people where it's you're not there to you know get beasted as such you're there to improve and there to build in your potential because what yeah. puts a lot of people off is like, oh i'm not feeling great i don't sure if I, how much i can do i don't want to you know go there and underperform yeah. but but yeah. again it's it's a natural kind of you know you're scared because it's going to be challenging it's going to build you but you know it's it's uncomfortable and most things are that are worth doing of course that you so going back to you with the mma stuff you know it's a challenge, you know, and then you could have folded in that challenge after they run through, oh, I don't, I don't want to be punched in the face or I don't want to do this. But, you know, you rise to that challenge, you know, and there's always obstacles for you. And uh, you've just got to get, you just got to get your head straight. And this is what you were saying uh, about the camaraderie stuff. Now, in the Marines, like I said a minute earlier on, my, I know the guy next, the reason why things have done so hard in the Marines, because ultimately that guy is going to, he's going to watch your back. And you're going to watch him. So you've got to be trained the same. So he knows he can trust you, and you know you can trust him, All right? But and everybody else. And with my guys, we've got millionaires, we've got massive business owners, we've got people who are uh, work at home mums, people who are unemployed. So you've got a massive range of uh, people on the spectrum, right? Massive range over hundred people that we've got there. But they, not one of them, not one of them are a bad person. Not one of them doesn't like the other one. They all get on. We all have massive groups at nights out, meals. And everyone gets on with everyone. You know, you, you see you see the, the barrister talking to the car mechanic. You see the millionaire talking to the unemployed person, all having a laugh and joking, buying each other's drinks and, you know, all first name terms and all going, oh, okay, give me a shout and I'll meet you for coffee. It's brilliant, that, you know, and it's that environment that is missed by so many military leavers that I have every single day I go to work. I still have that, albeit for an hour, two hours, three hours, but I still have it, you know? I have that banter. Yeah, Marine military banter, you know, gets me in trouble at times because the mark is sort of, is a bit sort of thin for me and I step over it quite a bit. But, you know, I can learning still process, have... Isn't it? It's all a learning curve. It is, mate, it is. And uh, well, you've seen my Facebook. And, uh, but it's, you know... Uh, the guys are great, and it's, it's the reason the Marines is the best job I could ever hope to do, and what I achieved there, you know, was brilliant. But this runs at a close second, uh, very, purely because everything that the guys bring to the party. I know I'm good at what I do, Dan. You know, uh, I was trained by the best, and I took, I've trained some of the best, but it's it, that means nothing if you haven't got the group in front of you, you know, and all of my guys. You know, are just absolutely fantastic people. You know, so I can't ask much more. But this goes back to this whole sort of status and substance kind of thing. That what does it mean, and what can it give to people? But anyway, it's been an absolute honour to have you on. Thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you? Uh, well, obviously, Commander Group Fitness. You can find me online. Obviously, www.commandergroupfitness.com, and also you can find us on the Facebook page. If you go on Facebook, the Commander Group Fitness Facebook page and on uh instagram commander figure commander group fitness.com on there and when we all back up and running where will your sessions be held okay well at a minute dan all my sessions are online if you're interested so i do 26 sessions a week for 37 quid online right i've got if you're if you're interested uh or any of your guys are but when this gets sort of relaxed we'll be back out in russell park and addison park in kempston fantastic mate and this episode is sponsored by Mola mma use code fc mma 20 at checkout for 20 percent off or Mola apparel and gloves